right, we're recording and we're we're chatting today on March 4th. Um, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Cruz. I'm a fifth year graduating this semester studying industrial systems engineering with a minor in international development. Um, I'm from Miami, Florida, uh, born and raised by Cubans, you know, Cuban all around my life, first generation student. Um, big Gator fan, so I've been here so the past five years and been super involved on campus, whether it's first generation uh, Society of Hispanic Russian Engineers or anything around the Hispanic Latinx community, uh, you'll find me there. All right, well, since you're Cuban, I'm going to change the angle of this. Okay. And reveal my job. All right, I like that. That's what's <laughs> I like that a lot. Actually, my backdrop is actually a picture I took of uh, when I was in Cuba of like the streets and stuff. So that's what I've been using as my, I guess, nice. street tapestry that people call it. Street tapestry? It's like, a, yeah, it's, I took a picture of like the streets of Cuba and then I just uh, amplified it and turned it into a tapestry. So that's been hanging in the back of my wall um, behind my bed. Well, I guess just first for the transcript, because I forgot to do this, I'm Arturo Gonzalez, who's going to be the interviewer. And um, I think let's talk a little bit about that, that background. Um, so your family's Cuban? Yeah, so it's a little complicated. Uh, I always say my fun fact is that I have four passports, uh, Cuban, Colombian, American, Spanish. The reason for that is I was born in Colombia. Uh, my Cuban parents immigrated there from Cuba with my siblings, also Cuban, um, to Colombia. They had me in Colombia. I was there until I was two lived in Cuba until I was three and then came to the United States, um, close to turning four. Uh, but yeah, I identify as Cuban 100 percent, even though I was born in Colombia, my whole family, you know, grandparents, godparents, any anything around them, the only one out. <laughs> um, but I still rep that Columbus side a little bit because I love the culture and the food. And I actually went back two, three years ago to visit the hospital and that I was born in and like the whole like building that I lived in with my dad. So it was really cool to like just see the Colombian side of my identity, but I definitely wrap that Cuban side 100% louder. So I definitely keep it. And the, the Spanish passport, where do you get that from? Yeah, uh, through my dad. Uh, so I went to study abroad in Spain, literally during COVID times, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and they recommended for easy travels to just, you know, get the Spanish passport. Um, if I would have gotten it before I was 18, I would have kept it. But because once you turn 18, you only have to choose two. I decided to just stick around with the American and Colombian passport. So if I ever had to go back to Colombia, um, because I was born there, I need to use that passport. Um, but because of my dad's transcendence uh, with my grandpa and stuff, we were able to actually get access to the Spanish passport. All right. So you're international. Mr. Worldwide. That's what a lot of people call me, uh, I, especially since I like Pitbull. Every time I get the fun fact, they're like, you're Mr. Worldwide. I'm like, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> and I guess to complete the Pitbull, you know, uh, we're beyond trifecta, but you happen to live in Miami too? Yep, exactly. And I actually, he went to my high school uh, to do a visit. He's like really close to my principal principal back then. Um, he would consider her like an aunt and everything. So we actually interned for him my senior year of high school through like academia to help him start the school that he started in Miami called SLAM. Um, so it was really cool. I didn't get to personally meet him. I got, the closest I got was a cutout uh, to meet a cutout of him. Um, but it was cool to still be in a space where he, you know, helped start schools and stuff like that. So, um, because he was really close to my principal, she, you know, they asked for like students to help him brainstorm and be part of their engine program. And I did that my summer before I started UF. So it's kind of a long time back. And now that school is like five, six years in of being built. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? How, how did you get involved with the Pitbull school? <laughs> and, and I forget exactly what it was called. Um, can, can you tell us what it was called to? Yeah. So the school is called SLAM. It stands for, I don't know what the acronym stands for. I think it's like sports leadership and management or something like that. But basically um, it's for students that wanted to just, you know, find a way with high school to incorporate their love for sports and still get a, a degree. So whether it's like communications, you know, like doing the reporting at sports or just, you know, working around with sports and physical therapy and stuff like that. Um, so my high school is a charter school. So they under the umbrella of academia. And so I just, you know, during my last year, they're like, hey, we have this opening. If you want to apply, they're selecting two students from every school um, to be part of the intern program. So it was pretty cool to like get exposed to that internship environment. Um, my senior year, that summer right before I started UF. 
And our project was just to kind of like go in and give students perspective and work around with the building of this new school, this kind of new accreditation. It's something that hasn't been seen before recently. So um, it was pretty cool to just, you know, be part of that slam background and just give them ideas and corporations. It's a big building and down South Miami. So it's really nice to see it up and running and still getting students to this day. I know one of the biggest, you know, concerns they had was like, will we actually get students? Will parents actually allow them to, you know, enjoy their passion while still getting their high school degree? And it's been working out fine for my, what I'm seeing, I think they're getting a lot of students and still growing every day. Do you still have any uh, connection with that project? No, I wish. I mean, I still get invites from academia to help them out. But once I, you know, landed my feet at UF, I just stuck all my involvement within UF. Um, there's definitely kids from my high school that stayed involved with academia, but that's if they wanted to go more of that route. You know, a lot of students are like pre-law students that wanted to end up working in like, you know, superintendent office and stuff like that. Once I realized, you know, the engineering internships where I, where I had to focus more of my time on, that's where I spent most of my track on. Well, and it, it, it does sound like you have a, a pretty long history of involvement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll so, say that. Well, you want to go through that? I mean, it, does it precede the uh, the involvement with SLAM? Was that the genesis? Well, I will say so, uh, just because I started, I mean, I've been involved since, I would say since my middle school days, mm -hmm. where I ran for like class treasurer, my seventh grade didn't win, but, you know, still persevered. Um, and then ninth grade year, I became vice president of our class and stayed vice president to my senior year. So been pretty involved then, then to like uh, leadership camp, became a junior counselor for that. So there's definitely been level ups to the involvement that I've come to. But then once I hit UF and realized that involvement is not just the lunch hour meetings that you have, it's actually meetings at night and it's meetings with like no supervisors, it's just students. Um, I started realizing, okay, I have to be kind of selective on the involvement I want to get involved in. Um, and I pretty much stayed consistent with my involvement since my first year at UF in 2016. Um, I did try student government, realizing that it wasn't really the route I wanted to go for, and then just stayed involved with the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and kind of built that up, realizing there's a lot of Hispanic engineers at UF, and there's a lot of potential that we can be a, a very big organization. And then since my year in 2016 to now, we've increased our numbers. Like our general body is right now is like 500 students, but our active body is around like close to 200. Even now with COVID times, we still have a good amount of presence uh, with both hybrid and stuff like that. And more programs are just coming up and, you know, flourishing. So I had the privilege of starting like the first year leadership program, which is kind of like MLP through what HSA does, which is a member leadership program. But basically it's, I came in as a freshman in engineering and I was like, okay, I'm pretty lost. So I feel like when I got to my sophomore year, I realized, okay, there might be other students that are lost as well. And I suggested that to our vice president. I was like, let's do a program similar to this. Like any bridge programs in your freshman year would be very useful. And to this day, actually last semester, I was the executive director of the program. And to this day, we still have a program every semester. So we increased our numbers from 12 students my sophomore year to now we have 25 to even 30 students part of the cohort. And I feel like they're just getting a lot of the experiences. You don't get taught within engineering of how the corporate world works. And then we realize that it's closer than it seems. So, um, I would say my involvement is pretty extensive, but it does stay in the realms of my identity, which is being, you know, Hispanic engineer and first gen. Um, and I think that's where I've seen myself excel because it comes with like personal passion. All right, there was there was a lot there, and I, I, I did. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're, no, no, no. This is great. So we're going to to dig a little deeper into some of what you said. Now, so it's. You, you really have this idea of the bridge program that you seem really passionate about. So let's go to your freshman year of college. Okay. All right. Before you, you could construct all of this, unless if you did. Construct no, I, I was very lost my freshman year. Um, I realized my fall semester, I even, I even applied to be my area dorm vice president. I was just, you know, applying to things. There's so many things out there. One of the big things that drew me to UF was because of involvement and how many opportunities were out there. Um, but it wasn't until that spring semester that I started realizing, okay, I need to be, you know, worthy of my time and constructive with what I want to get involved in and not just get involved with everything out there. So um, I resigned from vice president from that semester and then just started like venturing out. Um, I actually joined Greek life that semester. So fall semester, I was trying to do Greek life. I did the whole typical um, interfraternal council, which is the ones with the houses and stuff like that, realizing that wasn't a space for me. And then through my involvement in the Hispanic community, came across like Sigma Lambda Beta, which is my brotherhood at the moment. 
Um, and it's a Hispanic oriented, very small council, very different, you know, dues aren't insane of a thousand dollars or super small and short. So I realized, you know, maybe Greek life is for me, especially if it's uh, in money that. So it's a big, very strong uh, Spanish brotherhood. Um, been involved since, you know, at spring 2017. I'm one of the oldest active members at the moment. Um, literally the only act oldest from like that time period. So I always get called old head. Um, so it's kind of crazy to see from freshman year to now that I used to be like the youngest member to now being the oldest member. Um, but then that involvement kind of like was what geared me into realizing, okay, let's be more intentional. You don't have to get involved in everything, but try to select your top three. Um, and so that's when freshman year, I started, you know, venturing out and got more involved in the Society of Spanish Professional Engineers, stayed as a cabinet member, but then it wasn't until my junior year that I was e-board of both my fraternity and the Society of Spanish Professional Engineers. So um, definitely wasn't as, you know, as intentional as I was my junior year, as I was my, uh, I wasn't as intentional my freshman year as I was my junior year, because I was still exploring what was out there, you know, wanted to humble myself. I came from, you know, that, you know, top of my class in high school, but realized everyone at UF is top of their class in some aspects. So wanted to venture out before I decided what I wanted to dive myself into. And I don't regret it to this day. Um, even though I stayed in the smaller orgs that are seen at UF, you know, I didn't do the preview, the big orgs and stuff like that. I still felt valued on campus and I still felt like I made an impact, even though it was like a small community. So that's something I've learned throughout the years, something I didn't realize my freshman year. So that's one big key difference from like freshman year involvement to the other year involvements. So how did you use that experience then when you were constructing the first year leadership? Yeah, I think the cadenness, you know, just being real with myself. Um, I didn't realize at the point at that time I was facing in a sense imposter syndrome and not just like toss it out there, but it's it was kind of daunting at first coming to UF and realizing you know there's so many student organizations. If you want to be successful, you have to be successful from your day one. You know, I applied for you know uh, leaders of tomorrow within UF. I didn't get into that. I was getting a lot of rejections my freshman year. I was just like, maybe I don't fit in to be the U.S. type of leader that, you know, one thinks. But then I started realizing, I'm like, maybe that's just because I didn't feel prepared or no one really guided me in, you know, being first generation. My siblings didn't know anything as well either. You know, they went to uh, online school and then my sister went to FIU. So she didn't really know that U.S. environment that comes with like a college environment. And my parents, you know, mental came mental, so less and less, obviously. Um, so then that's when I realized and I sat down, I'm like, you know, as an engineer, you have to start looking at your career since day one, rather than just looking at involvement since day one. And that's when I sat down, um, you know, I came with, I came up with the suggestion, but then at the same time, the vice president at the moment was like, you know, this is something we definitely need. And we started building it. I started grasping some stuff from the member leadership program that I saw that, you know, the Hispanic Student Association was doing. And, you know, we started implementing it. Obviously the first two uh, cohorts went the best. You know, we would say we would have 12 students, but only like six or five were active. But to the point that we're at now, it's insane how like it's become tradition that any Hispanic engineers know that they should go through this first year leadership program. And it's open to first year students as well as transfer students. You know, you just transferred into your UF environment. So um, when we were creating this, we definitely just wanted to create a space where we're doing workshops, but intentional workshops. So it's showing you like your resume building and your elevator pitch. But at the same time, like how do you climb the leadership, you know, the leadership ladder and ship? How do you get more involved? What do you do um, with grad school? What do you do with study abroad? You know, what do you do with at your time at UF? How do you make access of all the free resources? I didn't know those free tutoring until I joined SHIP. And I was like, this is perfect. You know, that study edge account after a while did rack up some money. So let me take advantage of all the free stuff at UF. So we just kind of compiled that all in one space and just, you know, help students kind of maneuver that their first year so that they're just prepped and feel equipped and don't feel like they can face that imposter syndrome that a lot of people face during the first two years at UF. Well, I mean, it sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been a long ride. It sounds like you guys are in a good place now. Um, now your, your first two years, you said there were challenges. What, what yeah. were those challenges? Um, I think it was like a lot. So I think I turned 18. So now you're an adult, you know, it's, you don't have mom and dad there kind of in a sense, you know, I was a baby of the family. Um, so I always was used to like, you know, getting my laundry done, you know, get I'm not having to worry about the meals, but I decided myself that I wanted to come to UF. So I had to show that I was equipped for that. So it was, how do you find time in a dorm to cook, to clean, to study, to go to meetings? You know, how do I, I never felt organized until my second year at UF where I was like, okay, 
in order for me to do everything I want to do, I have to schedule myself out. I can't just, you know, start my day out of blank. Um, so that's when like agendas started becoming my best friends and sticky notes on my laptop is the best thing I can ever have possibly. Um, but a lot of the hurdles came from like, you know, how do I not show weakness to my family members that I'm here, but at the same time showing them that I'm excelling. So obviously I never told my parents whenever I got a bad grade or whenever I didn't get into one of these student organizations, or I even didn't even tell them anything about student organizations because they would be kind of mad that I'm not spending my time on studies and focusing on involvement, but they didn't realize how important involvement was. Um, so then that's when I started realizing, okay, I have to also make my close knit family here from people that understand and can build me up from their experiences. So that's where I guess mentorship became a really big thing as well as like getting involved with older folks on campus. Um, so towards my sophomore year, I feel like I found myself at a better place. I moved into an apartment you know instead of living with 55 guys in the dorm i'm now living with four of us in a personal bathroom so i think just this change of space also made things you know clearer and more i guess just chill in a sense to keep it simple um before that chaotic environment of the dorm and you know the campus life and constant here and there um did you know did bring me awareness of like can i balance this on top of that engineering classes and stuff like that but i made it this far i'm graduating this in two months so definitely proud of how far i've come but you know those first two years did build up the character that i am today um so i wouldn't you know take it back at all but i would definitely say that they were a bit patchy well congratulations on making it through <laughs> yeah, thank you uh, super excited so why why is it that you were um not telling your family certain things you know sort of keeping it to yourself uh this question of not wanting to seem weak can you explain that a little bit Definitely. Um, not to make this a therapy session, but uh, it's just I I think, you know, as a first gen student, you try to only t highlight the good things like I would didn't highlight the day that, you know, they stole my laundry basket at, in the dorm because then they'll be like, you know, why? Why are you doing laundry at night? And I'm like, that's the only time I have. And I didn't want to tell them that. So it'd be things here and there that I would check in. Obviously, I would open up about some bad stuff, but I would limit myself to what bad stuff I would say. Um, um, like, you know, being as a freshman, I also had to cook myself. So there was sometimes I had no idea what I was doing in that dorm kitchen and stuff like that. But I think the main thing I kind of hid from them at first was all the involvement I was getting involved in. Um, just because my dad, every time I would talk on the phone would repeat, like, you know, you have to focus on your studies, put involvement aside. And I kept on telling him until I realized, you know, I'm just going to do me and not have to repeat myself every time and tell them how important involvement is, especially for you know, resume development, but, you know, character development too. As much as I do try to learn it from class, you really can't. Um, so those are one of the main things that I would hide from them in a sense of like, I didn't want to show weakness and not weakness in the sense of like, you know, you're weak, you can't do this. Let me, let me help you out. But in a sense of like, I didn't want to worry them. I wanted to make sure that the decision I made to come to UF was the right one. And, you know, as safe as possible and coherent, you know, making sure that what I was doing was the right choice for me. So if I would alert them of anything different, they would just automatically say, hey, come back. You know, you can, you always have this home. I'm like, no, that's not the goal. Like the goal is to be here and build myself up and just, you know, feel like I am an adult at age, at age of 18. Even though I swore I was an adult by then, I was realizing I was not an adult at the age of 18. But, you know, just making sure that they felt safe as well as much as I wanted to feel safe. Um, because me being far away, being the first one of my family to go through a whole college experience like this, I wanted to make that transition as seamless for me, but also for them. And through the years, they come to realize like, okay, you know, you've made it through. Um, now we don't even have to call every day, but my freshman year, I would have to call them every day and give them like a live report on everything just to make sure that, you know, I was in good stance. Um, but that was pretty much it. And what about your siblings? What did they think about the whole deal? Uh, so fun fact, my siblings are 10 and 11 years older than me. So it was a big difference. They each have two kids. So they're in a different space and different time um, of, their, of their life. Like I was in high school when my niece was born. I was entering UF when my nephew was born on my sister's side. So obviously they also never got that college experience. My brother went to Embry-Riddle to become a pilot, but he did that online majority of the time. And then my sister went to FIU, but she treated it as like a commuter school where she didn't even get involved on campus and stuff like that. Got married pretty early as well. So I feel like the odd one out. And I've pretty much felt that my whole entire life being such a, such a baby in the family. Um, they were super excited. My sister was a little bit jealous because my, she actually got into UCF when she was applying in college and my mom did not let her. She was like, do not, you're not allowed to leave, you know, just go to school right here. 
obviously during that time period we had freshly come um, to the United States. It would be it would have been like five years since we came to the United States. So I would definitely see the hesitation. But obviously, 10 years later, um, when I was telling my mom, hey, I'm going to UF, I also didn't get the approval right away, but I was pretty stern about it and showed her, hey, like I'm going on a pretty much on a full ride. Like there's no reason you can stop me in a sense, obviously with respect, but this is something I want to do. So I just want your support. Um, and they've been supportive ever since. You know, my mom calls herself a Gator mom. She's part of the like Hialeah Gator Moms Association in a sense. Uh, it doesn't really exist, but there's a lot of moms out there that she kind of communicates with. So um, my siblings, you know, to answer your question, they were definitely supportive. I would say my sister more than anyone. As much as she was jealous at first, she was like, you know, live your dream and I'm living it through you. And she's, you know, she'll call me up every now and then and just be like, hey, how's it going? Um, how, how are things with this? You know, I have a, a friend that went there and she actually connected me through one of her friends. And that's how I even got to a uh, Goldman Sachs internship opportunity. I didn't end up, you know, going through the internship opportunity to realize financial isn't for me, but her being a chemical engineer, she told me I got to get a mentor right away, right? Even at, before stepping foot into college and kind of exploring me and telling me like, hey, when you get into your first year, you want to, you know, kind of freak me out a little bit, telling me you have to worry about your internships, worry about this, worry about that. But it was helpful that through my sister, I actually gained a mentor through UF and was one of the first ones of many, you know, that I've come. The reason I am here today is because of the mentors that had built me up. But I would definitely say my sister has been one of the most supportive ones since day one um, and just kind of giving me some general tips, advice. Um, it didn't have to be specific for UF, but just realizing like, hey, you're there for a reason. Just push through. Um, so I would definitely give you give you that as a response. Now. You mentioned it, um, the effect that the full ride had. Yes. What what effect do you think the the MFOS scholarship has had on your college experience or, or just your life more generally? Uh, everything. I I told them since day one, even from the moment I got the email. I remember I was in high school. I'll never forget. I was in high school. It was me and another friend that we were like, you know, kind of depending on to hear back from MFOS because. If I got MFOS, there was no clear shot that my parents could turn me down from coming here because I'm like, not in a rude sense, but I can become independent if needed um, for me to be able to get that college experience. So my other friend were on the same boat. I remember her getting her email letter first and I was already thinking like, that's it. I'm not going to UF. I haven't gotten this. You know, there's no way I'm going to be able to afford it. I actually even got a job my senior year of high school behind the back of my parents so that I can start racking up money. Until my mom started realizing like, hey, there's no reason you're at swim practice until 11 p.m. And I was working at H&M and then she checked my location. She actually showed up and I'm like, hey, yeah, I've been working here for a month um, and because they never wanted me to get a job either. You know, they've always been like, we want to provide everything for you. But I think that always wanting to provide everything for me made me realize I want to earn something for myself, you know, either being immigrants or being first generation or just, you know, that Cuban mentality. I always wanted to have something for myself. Um, so. Once I, you know, got that, got that job, I started realizing, you know, if I had to pay for, for college, I'll do it for the experience. But that day in high school, when I got that letter, I think I feel like the biggest burden I ever had in my entire life off my shoulder. I never realized I didn't have to ask my parents for money because, you know, it's kind of intense to ask for, you know, low income families for money when I'm trying to enjoy my college experience. So I always and always will be grateful. And I've always kind of shown that through my involvement with MFOS, you know, I was a mentor an ambassador, a leadership team, now working with some outside initiatives. I'm like, I can't give you guys money because you're giving me the money, but let me be a resource to y'all. Um, since my first day at you know MFOS, um, we had like an orientation day that Sunday of our freshman year. And ever since then, I went, remember I went up to Leslie and I was like, I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity. Please let me know, we know where my time can be valuable and how much I can assist you guys. And, you know, keep moving the scholarship forward. I'll never forget after my first internship, I actually made like a $50 donation to MFOS. And I was just like kind of exciting because I'm like, you know, I'm already giving back to the program that's giving me so much. Um, and to this day, I stay grateful. That's why Leslie reached out to me because she knew I would drop everything I can to be part of anything that has MFOS's name on it. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here or be able to live, I guess, like not the lavish life at UF, but, you know, a good amount of life that I don't feel like I'm different from the other students because I do have a good bundle of money thanks to the scholarship as well as you know my internships as well well that sounds amazing sounds like you really know how to how to hustle you know, i try to i try and to. how to make how to improve your situation so let's talk about this question of mentorship 
because it's come up a few times. So you talked about your sister, but do you have any other specific mentors that you would want to highlight or talk about that have influenced you? Yes, um, I have so many. I think uh, I would say, you know, going back to the imposter syndrome, in a sense, my first two years, I never gained a mentor that was like professional staff or even a professor. So I felt the disconnect there, but the mentors that were just two or three years older than me showed me so much, you know, especially when it came to engineering, they prepped me up with my resume, my elevator pitch. They actually made me feel like the work that I'm doing is valuable. I just have to fluff it up um, in a sense, or like know how to project myself, know how to present myself and stuff like that. So, you know, easily the vice president at the time when I joined SHIP, Alejandra Garcia, she was like, you know, the number one right there. She was just like, you know, apply to this, you know, um, scholarship, apply to this, do this. So she was sending me the, the links and I've realized now that that's something I've been doing now that I just sent out information because that's how I started getting my involvement. Um, and I think that mentorship just came out of an angle of like not forced. So at the same time, we started becoming friends, even though she was two or three years older than me, I was even 21 at that point. So I couldn't enjoy her night, night outings, but she would still make the effort to made me feel like I was involved on campus, made me feel like I had a mentor and a friend. And from there, just mentors started popping up, you know, even to the point one that was my roommate during the summer, he was two years older, but he would help me with all my internships that I was doing with PNG at the point. He was like, you know, you align yourself here, 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 I'll connect you. So that's when I started realizing that mentorship also leads to connections because it's, it's not what you do or what you do, it's who you know. Um, and I started valuing that way more than I did before. It came with mentorship, but then I started realizing, you know, the connections I made with my mentors and stuff like that has been the most successful thing to my career. Um, because again, it's who you know and who I've been with. And if you know this person can recommend me super well, then they know they can you know help, help me on and stuff like that. So I would say a lot of my mentors came from the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers because I was scared to what this point in my life would be, you know, the next steps after college, because I never thought that far, you know, when I was in high school, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to UF, but I'm like, okay, what after that? I was like, I'll worry about it once I get there. But when I realized that you have to start worrying about that since pretty much your sophomore year, I was like, okay, let me seek some, you know, first generation corporate people at the same time, because I realized I'm also first gen corporate, you know, white collar workers, stuff like that. So how do I also get those opportunities under my buckle? How do I make sure that I can still feel like the person I am today, you know, the loud Cuban in a workspace made for engineers and stuff like that. So all the candidness and all the like humbleness and all the, you know, all the different tactics that comes to like building who I am today came through my mentors. And there's just so many I can list because I also got paired with mentors through, through shit, but then I also gained mentors throughout the way. But then once my junior year hit, I started getting involved more on like campus initiatives that I got a pro faculty mentor. And that's when I'm like, if a person that's in their 50s and like, you know, is doing super well UF and has such a high standard and stuff like that is mentoring me out of their goodwill, I feel like there's something in me that I can definitely, you know, have passion for something like that. So once I got that mentor, I was like, okay, now what other, what's the next mentor I'm seeking? So I started realizing I'm seeking mentors as I move up the ladder in my career path. Um, so now I'm realizing I want a mentor in my engineering industry. So consulting and stuff like that. So now I'm getting closer to my, you know, HR representative for my future company. So I'm realizing that mentorship doesn't stop. You know, as you keep growing, you're going to have mentors along the way. But I will say the first few mentors I had my freshman year have paved the way for me to think of mentorship, to think about connections and to think about, you know, you can't you can't get there alone. There is a whole team kind of rooting for you in the back. It's beautiful. Yeah, it was a whole mouthful <laughs> and a lot of corniness, but, you know, I do stand by mentorship 100%. And that actually led me into wanting to start the FLP program because mentorship is, that's where you just feel kind of safe. Like you have someone at least to hug at the end of the day, whether it's tough or, or celebratory, you know, at least you have someone there that has seen you through the beginning to the end. And we've talked about it before, but I'm going to just ask this question again yeah. uh, in, a, in a different way. But now... How do you then give back in your yeah. role as a mentor for other people? I think um, so. My first mentor position was through MFOS. I was a mentor of four, four first generation students. And I think for me, that's when I started realizing, you know, it's hard to be a mentor to people you don't have anything similarities with. So that's when I started realizing, okay, I have to venture out and find some similarities with them. So 
you know, we started, started you know, exploring some eating options, you know, some hobbies. So two of my mentees I would run stadiums with on the side. The other two, we would focus on like eating very two different extremes, you know, <laughs> um, but it was still a way for me to connect with them outside of just a regular one-on-one -on -one meetings at Marshall Library. You know, I didn't want that to feel like the end all be all. I think the biggest thing with mentorship and giving back is to make, make them feel like they have a friend. Um, I didn't don't expect them to confide in me since day one, but it was kind of crazy to see the build up from the beginning of the semester to the end, where some of them confided in me like, "Hey, I have to drop a class. I haven't told anyone. Can you be, you know, of assistance for me and stuff like that?" Or you know, I'm having this issue back home with my parents, and I can't. I don't know where to stay for winter break. I have to stay in the dorm and stuff like that. So I put them in contact with some RAs that I knew that were staying with their break so that they wouldn't feel so alone and stuff like that. So you know, little things like that that it's like, if I wasn't there, then who would have been? And, um, and like, you know, how helpful can I be? But I also at the same time, I give them the space for that. So obviously with mentorship, you don't want to overpower and I don't want to come off as like, I know everything. I also want to learn from you as I go through it. So I think the best thing I do is just, you know, get to know them on a personal level outside of like the forced mentorship opportunities that we have to do. And that's just builds the genuine connection. And that's something I stand by very strongly where it's not just making a connection on just to connect on LinkedIn type of thing. It's more of like, that genuine collection where if I know your name, it's because I also know at least one part of your story. Um, and that's something that I've been trying to do as a mentor. And I think I have like easily 13, 14 mentees at this point in my fifth year. Um, the last one I got was fall um, from the ship also. And I was like, okay, this is my last one. I'm not taking any mentees this semester. Um, Cause at this point, even my mentees have mentees. So I think my time here is done, um, but I'm still acceptable. So I'll, obviously all the first years that I helped with the program in the fall semester, I consider all 30 of them in a sense my mentees, but not my direct mentees. But I still even then try to be genuine doing the workshops that we were doing and stuff like that. So I think the key is genuine and just making sure you get that personal connection before you try to make that mentor connection. They say that teaching is the best way to learn. Exactly. So what What have you learned from teaching your mentees? Um, I think it honestly just every time I meet a new freshman, I think it just brings me back to realizing like where I started. So I think one of the main things I've learned is to stay grounded, you know, um, as much as you know, where you get, you also want to build up others that are trying to get there. Um, and I just, I just feel I, I don't know, but I, it's kind of it's kind of cliche at me, I'm only 23. But I do feel young in a sense, like I feel like I'm lionhearted in a sense, because I'm still giving back to such a young generation, you know, these are kids that were born in the 2000s. And it's kind of crazy, the big generational difference but we still make it work and they still look at me as a potential friend in a sense. So I do think, you know, that, that connection that I've learned from them um, of keeping it humble, because then you realize the connections I make later on with maybe fourth or fifth years, it's not about, it's not that it's competitive, but it's not as humbling or as genuine as it is when you make it with the first year that's pretty lost and doesn't know what to do. Um, then I think the most exciting thing that I've learned from that is their growth. Um, obviously, I was part of one of their pebbles of their stepping stones to get to where they are, but it still impacts me and motivates me knowing that I made that little effort. Like yesterday, my mentee got into his Microsoft internship and he like thanked me for it. But I'm like, dude, it's all you. All I told you, all I sent you was the links and you followed through and you did this. And if you ask me for resources, I'll plug you in. But just still the fact that they want to thank me makes me feel happy because I'm still impacting as many people as I can through just sending a general, you know, WhatsApp link of, hey, apply to this internship. But he was like, if you didn't send me that, I would have not known. So I'm like, just little things like that, that I'm like, I want to be a resource hub, hub to a lot of people. And it's just now with all technologies that we can do, it's not that hard. So I think that's definitely been keeping me just grounded to realize, you know, I remember when my mentor sent me my first internship link and I made it this far and stuff like that. So just realizing the effects of how mentorship has affected me, I've always put that forward to when I try to mentor other people. All right, let's let's go back to your background a little bit. <laughs> some some more foundational stuff. First off, what did your parents do, or or what do they still do? Yeah, so my mom is actually uh, an assistant principal at a daycare slash elementary. It goes up to fifth grade. Um, she actually studied. Um, she studied like. She tried to do her like uh, certifications to be able to be vice principal and stuff like that, but she has a mindset of like an industrial engineer. So she was very supportive when I switched my major from biomedical to industrial. And I started off as biomedical because my dad back in Cuba was a doctor. 
um, to some extent. And so he wanted me to like pursue that here at UF. And I was like, I'm not going into medicine, even though now during these COVID times, I kind of regret it. I would have had the vaccine by now, but um, <laughs> my, he's actually a behavioral therapist. So when he came to the United States, he obviously didn't have his degree. He didn't have much. Um, he started off working at Moves to Go, you know, making ends meet to one point, And then he realized his passion was in behavioral therapist. Um, although that business and that, you know, government side is not doing so well right now, um, even with the pandemic, you know, he's still unemployed and stuff like that. It still shows his passion for like the medicine world. Um, and so that's what he does back home. Tell me a little more about the Cuban background. You know, yeah. what, what does that mean to you? And what, what did your parents, you know, tell you that it was supposed to mean? And then how did you internalize that yourself? And I know there's a difference. Yeah, there is a difference for sure. I mean, it's, it means that I'm loud. I'll, I'll put that out first. Um, you know, that's one thing I want to take away from my personality. I remember asking Pitbull when he came to UF, I was one of the first ones to like, he came for like an accent speaker. I remember I was one of the first ones to ask a question. I was like, how do you bring your true self to like a business world? And like, he was like, I don't, I'll never forget his answer. He was like, um, I'll come into the office door with the boom box beaming, uh, booming, but then once it's time to settle down, I'll turn it down. And I'm like, you know, I respect that. I still, to this day, I value that I'm Hispanic, that I'm Cuban, that I'm first generation, that I'm an immigrant, you know, so many identities, but at the same time, they're, they're valued into who I am, the reason I am that I, who I am. And yeah, I guess the reason a lot of people, you know, find me approachable and stuff like that. So I think the Cubanness of me that has been instilled, especially living in Hialeah, Florida, which is like Cuban centered. Um, it's made it clear that it's who I am and who I don't regret being. Um, you know, that family aspect of, you know, the, the lechon uh, during Noche Buena and stuff like that. Just those celebratory stuff is what's kept me realizing that tradition is still a thing, you know. And then once I came to UF, a PWI, PWI, I was like, how do I still find myself relevant? So when I came to UF, CASA, which is a Cuban American Student Association, wasn't even a thing. It was like dying down. And then it wasn't until my junior year, I remember this one guy decided to like revamp it up. He started off with just a simple poster in Turlington with like little lollipops and just saying, hey, are you Cuban? Come join us. And now that organization has grown so much that they're even doing dominoes. Um, they're playing dominoes at the Library West. And I just feel like that screams Cuban. Like, you know, I don't feel like many other culture would have, I guess, the, the feel, the rite of passage to just plant a big Cuban tree, I mean, Cuban flag in the middle of Library West, set up Domino's tables and then put, you know, our typical Cuban music. And I just feel like that's part of showcasing that, you know, we're not afraid to show who we are. And that's something that's been instilled in me from my Cuban heritage. Um, that's made me outspoken, but in a good way, obviously. I know my limitations to when not to be super loud and outspoken, but it's still made me who I am today because of that Cuban heritage, for sure. Did your parents ever go to you and say, you know, remember you're Cuban and that means X, Y, Z. Uh, I would, yes. <laughs> Especially with my crisis of uh, my Colombian and my Cuban. Um, they're like, you eat arroz frijol, you eat rice beans and me every day. Like you're definitely Cuban. Like, you know, they don't do this in Colombia. So um, I think I never faced that because I was in Hialeah. So I was reminded every day of my time that I was Cuban especially with the radios and like just living and having to realize I have to speak Spanish first in Publix. I never had a pub sub in, in Miami because we would have like cantinas, which is like a full set of food and stuff like that. So um, that's where I would tie in your question to like culture shock. So I think I never got reminded that I was Cuban until I got to UF. Um, I felt like before I never had to process that, but once I got to UF, I feel like I had to call my parents and tell them like, Hey, speak to me like loud Cuban real quick. So I can, feel recharged and, you know, just realize that I'm actually Cuban. Um, because once I got here, realizing there's so many other, um, even Hispanic identities, I never had an Asian in any of my classes. I never had a Brazilian in any of my classes. It was literally like 90% Cuban and then the rest were other Hispanic identities in my high school. So um, I will say that I had to be reminded who I was when I got to UF in a sense, because it wasn't that much around me. But even then it made me even more proud. It made me feel like I had to put myself out there um, on the sidetrack, I even became a promoter for like two months for Latin Nights here in Gainesville um, because I love that environment so much. So it was like, I didn't feel like I had to be constantly reminded until I got here. But even then, that didn't even last long. It was only my first year that I feel like I had to be reminded. And then after that, I was like, you know what, let me own this and feel proud and not have to like hide it. Hmm. 
Well, let's, let's dive a little deeper into that. So okay. when you got here, why did you, why were you reminded that you're Cuban? Why is it that, that, that became a, a more active part of, of your identity in that you were conscious of it? I think because I never, I guess I started realizing that more towards my senior year of high school. Once I started going into like, um, you know, our clubs had like the National Art Society had a conference in D.C. And I would say like, oh, like X, Y and Z, I'm Cuban. And I remember someone asking me like, oh, is that part of Puerto Rico? I was just like, OK, I guess, you know, people here don't know what Cuban is or like what being Hispanic is. That was one of my first big culture shocks. So I guess once I got to UF. Um, the fact that I had to remind a lot of people that I was Cuban made me remind myself that I was Cuban in a sense, um, or, you know, there would be like, I mean, I mean, I was asked before if I was Mexican too, you know, the typical cliche stuff that they see brown skin acting Hispanic. Um, I've been made fun of my Miami accent before. I never realized I had an accent until I got to UF also. So I would say it's a culture shock, but it was a refreshing culture shock. I never took it as anything negative. I took it more as more of empowering. And that's when I realized, you know, I want to get involved in my Hispanic communities here while still being involved in the communities on campus that are usually predominantly white, whether that was at one point, you know, that's when I was trying to get more involved in the student government, but then realized it wasn't for me. So I was like, let me get involved in other sectors on campus that still, you know, don't show the representation that's needed. Um, even then in the Society of Hispanic Russian Engineers, it's usually Colombians and Venezuelans from Weston. So just me being one of the first ones to like, show that I'm Cuban, part of the e-board and stuff like that, like even men in law in my own Hispanic bubble. So it was kind of crazy to see um, just the culture shock that you would expect from moving from Miami full of Cubans to maybe the U.F. that doesn't even know what a Cuban is, you know. So definitely, definitely uh, reminded, but at the same time empowering to just be more Cuban. Even mom said it, she was like, I think you're more Cuban now than you were in high school. I'm like, okay, I'll take that, I'll take that. <laughs> I, I feel that all of that on a personal level. Yeah, I saw you nodding your head, so I'm like, I feel like you probably resonated a lot. I remember I, I went to uh, out west. I was in Colorado, and I was with my mom. And the waiter asked, oh, where are you from? Already, that's kind of a provocative question. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't just ask anyone that. Yeah. And, and then she goes, Cuba. And he goes, oh, where? This is, this is how presumptuous he was. Where in Mexico is oh. that? Uh, not not is it part no where <laughs> they're only used to that so i like in in miami you would assume everyone's cuban so i can see how that changes but like once you leave florida everyone just assumes anyone that's hispanic is mexican um and not that I, you know i take it offensively I, I love my mexican friends and stuff like that but it's just the lack of education and i and that's not even us being cuban i had friends that are like they didn't even know where venezuela is they were asking if it was an island like I've seen it firsthand for a lot of different, you know, Hispanic identities. So it's kind of crazy. We're still dealing with that after so many people go through geography and social studies and stuff like that. But, you know, I, it's stuff like that that keeps me, that makes me realize that I am different, but at the same time that I want to keep that different identity. And, you know, I don't, you know, it doesn't bother me. And that's something that I built before I did. Cause I'm like, why is this person calling me this? Or why do they not know this? I even called my mom, like, can you believe this? And she'd be like, <laughs> uh, I can't believe that, but I guess that's where you're realizing now that you're, out out on a different side you'd figure you know like there was that whole spanish american war thing you think people yeah. don't know where it was uh <laughs> it's in the news every once in, in a the while news everywhere no literally just you know? research a little bit <laughs> that's crazy oh man well let's see what else is there to talk about plenty i'm sure there's so much. Yeah, I can I can ramble on for days, especially if it's anything with like my identities being first gen Hispanic. Um, there's just I've learned a lot. Of, I didn't even know what an identity was. So I guess, you know, UF has taught me a lot. And I'm reflecting on the five years of like how, you know, cross intersectionality works, you know, everything. They all these identities and at the end sum up to who I am. Um, and I never realized like first gen was one of them until I got my acceptance, you know, MMF West. Even when I was applying, I was questioning it with everything of like, you know, being, you know, in high school, like no one really knew like what first gen was because that's something like a college term. So just even being like welcomed into that community made me realize like, okay, you know, there's an area and a space for people like me that have no idea what they're getting themselves into, but there's still like a safe space and there's still like resources, there's still, you know, advisors, there's still people that want to work with you. So um, as I got more into that identity, I started realizing, okay, like 
don't take it as a negative, but take it as a positive. And that's something I always tell a lot of my first gen mentees, like, you know, don't use your first gen identity as uh, I guess, like as a con, I actually, during my elevator pitch, I introduced myself, like, hello, my name is Adrian Cruz, I'm a first generation, fifth year student at the University of Florida, like, I make sure I incorporate that in there, because it does show the value of how far you've gotten, and, you know, realizing, like, mom, without having mom and pop support, it's, it's tough, you know, you know, usually those are the first people you go to, but when they don't know what involvement is, or they don't know what, like, getting the RTS is, or what looking into apartments is, you know, there's a lot of different things and components that makes you, part of the first in identity because you feel like you were alone, but then that makes you seek out like, again, mentors, friends. Like I consider my friends here at UF like my family. So it's kind of sad to see, you know, class of 2020 not have a graduation and stuff like that because that was supposed to be my graduating class. Um, but then luckily I did five years for engineering. So I saved myself for that one, that one bit. But it's just crazy how, you know, with first gen, your family in college is that family. You know, you realize that that's the support system because they understand you and value you. Um, but at the same time, I've also taught the ropes to my parents so they can still kind of catch up and ask me some stuff, but, you know, not feel, obviously at this point, they're not feeling as scared as they did, you know, my freshman year. So now I can open up and tell them about a lot of things. Um, and yeah, you know, it's been, it's been, it's been a crazy ride for sure. What do you think you've taught your parents? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I taught them to be open-minded if that's I think that's a good way to put it I think the open-mindedness of me leaving a college and then having an empty nest for a good time um, and all the learnings I did you know like I went through datorship I've done um, you know MCDA so I've taught them a good amount of stuff but just the open-mindedness of like you came to the United States for a reason you don't want to stay in that bubble so you know once my I told my mom she was like okay I'm gonna leave the apartment in Hialeah under your name I'm like no, you can leave that under my sister's name. Like I, not that I don't want anything to do with my hometown, but I just want to move from that and come back. I definitely want to move out of that bubble and have that open-mindedness. And that's something I didn't have before. And I realized I didn't gain that through my parents. That's something I've gained for myself. Um, and just, you know, the combination of years at UF has definitely helped me build that open-mindedness understanding. And I feel like I've given them snips of that as you know, they've flown to see me through my internships. They've come to UF to help me move in. So they've seen part of my identity. And that's not like they just left me at stray. So they've been pretty involved. But I just opening them up the, the doors that I've been opening has been helping them be more open minded to like change and transitions and stuff like that. Because if it was up to my Cuban immigrant parents, you know, they would have never learned English in the sense my dad still doesn't know English, but he still ventures out to try to connect the, the dots in English if he can. So there's just a lot of open-mindedness components of realizing, you know, the end-all be-all isn't just Hialeah, you know, there's so much out there that it's even made my dad be more, wants to travel more and stuff like that. So it's been very, very helpful in that sense. It can carry some conversations, especially during these um, political times and stuff like that. You know, it's been a little rough going back home with the differences, but it's been open-mindedness that we can have that conversation still. Well, in the same vein of open-mindedness, did you ever go back and either they said something or you said something and they said, oh, you know, you went to college and oh, you're being yes. influenced by all those liberals there yes. you know, and anything like that? A hundred percent. I guess the term of like snowflakes in a sense, um, because I would advocate for a lot of the, you know, that's been my role here at UF and I minored in international development and humanitarian assistance. So I think that being a spokesperson and realizing my privilege of like, you know, being a male of where I am and what I can do in some spaces like that. Like it's been part of my identity and what I want to do in my career world too. So I have had those conversations, especially during quarantine, you know, living out there for six months has, was a little tough. And it's not just even my parents, it's also my, my brother. So my sister on the other side is more on my side and can see the progressiveness. But then my brother with his um, wife and stuff, it's, it's a little challenging to, explain why the snowflakes in a sense, quote unquote, are snowflakes and where we've come to get to this point and stuff like that. So it's been abrupt discussions, I won't lie to you. You know, some of them did get to a different level that they shouldn't have. You know, talking about racism with the human family is a very touch, touch, touchy subject, especially when I point out things that I never realized until now that I'm like, hey, that was racist when I was like younger and stuff like that. And it's crazy to think that my own family was part of the system that I'm trying to like break down on this mental as I'm going through my major and stuff like that. So um, 
I will say that those were the tough, tough side, but it, it gave me a position of rat, gratitude to my education, but it also gave me a realization that education is a privilege as well. Um, because I've learned so much through X, Y, and Z and realizing that, you know, maybe my brother never learned the history of the United States since he was an immigrant child and then he came here at 12, 14 and stuff like that. So stuff like that to the open-mindedness, they have an extent, but now like more and more realizing that they are doing the research because, you know, sometimes with the open-mindedness, they'll send me some stuff and I'm like, dude, this is a clip art, you know, thing. I don't know why you're trusting this or this is from like the Facebook. So I remember I sent them I'm like, with their open-mindedness, more my mom, more than anything, I sent her like the social dilemma uh, Netflix documentary. I was like, look, just check this out. I feel like you will, you'll enjoy it. And then after that, we were able to like debrief it and stuff like that. But I will say um, the whole cottage thing is that they're, they'll attack it in the sense of like, you know, I don't know what you're learning over there, or what they're teaching you. My dad's never been in favor of the American education system. He says it's like too much work or too, too long or something. So, you know, it's all this open-mindedness it's little and it's not to the extent that I want it to be, but it's definitely been a change from my, from my senior year of high school to now where I can have those conversations with them. Obviously I've grown too. So it's become more natural, but um, I have had them tell me that, you know, you went off to college. I don't know who you think you are now or where you're learning over there. And I'm like, we're just a different generation. And I just need you to like ramp up up and realize that, you know, especially being immigrants and stuff like that. I still feel like they're sometimes stuck, stuck, and that Castro regime as well, like that mentality of like the negative side of, you know, political power and stuff like that, which at the end of the day, they all do have a negative side. Um, but it was just more like, how do we carry that conversation without it escalating? And it has escalated in a lot of scenarios, but how do I show them some resources and stuff like that? And like have them learn about it or like, how do I educate my parents on racism? And I thought it was gonna be something so simple and it's not. And we haven't even gotten on the point of like transgenders and stuff like that. How do we welcome them? with the pronouns, you know, my, my girlfriend's best friend, she identifies with they, them. How do I introduce that into my dad who doesn't acknowledge that in a sense, you know? So stuff like that. Um, and then they will also base it off of like our generational media influencers, like Bad Bunny and stuff like that. Like when I told him, I was like, I want to get something like this. Or like, oh, it's because of Bad Bunny. I'm like, no, like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just the way we've come to be a part of our generation. You know, we're moving forward. Um, the only thing keeping us back is y'all pretty much like, you know, there's just a lot of things that I've realized that it's also not just even age generation, but it's like immigration generation, you know, the experiences my parents went through with like when Castro came in, that was literally in that time period. But then I also see that generational difference with my grandparents at home. So I also have to express that imagine to another generation on top of my parents and stuff like that. So it is quite challenging, but again, it comes down to like education is the best way to learn. And I feel like I've learned patience <laughs> out of the most. Um, but in a nutshell, yes, I've gotten that question and that statement a lot of times. And I don't let, let that hurt me, but rather than put myself in the place of privilege, like, hey, I've learned this much because of the places that I was in, for sure. And your grandparents, what did they think about the whole thing? Have, have, are they? There's just, they're just in their own, they're, they're in a different mentality. Um, the little comments that they would throw, you know, here and there watching the TV, especially during the whole riots and stuff like that. Like, and then they'll have the audacity to say like, I'm not racist or like that just because my dad would say, oh, I have a, I have a black friend, I'm not racist. I'm like, that does not mean anything. So, and even then I'm still getting messages from like my, my, my brother asked telling me like, hey, there's this documentary, there's this that shows like racism isn't a thing. And I'm just like, you maybe haven't experienced it, but you have to put yourself at a privilege because some of my family members are white passing. So then, you know, they might not experience it. Like, obviously you come into a different space, you will feel it. And I realized here in my tummy UF that the experiences my friends have gone through made me realize in culture shock and realize like, hey, some of this stuff is actually real and it's happening to people right next to me. Um, so I think educating my grandparents, that's on a different level. I try not to get on that. Um, especially during that time period during quarantine where all the news was just crazy stuff at that point. So I would just listen to see what their reactions would be and just take personal note on it. Um, Cause even then my grandparents and my mom and her siblings would bump heads on like generational differences. So I'm like, if they're bumping heads, I know for a fact we will bump heads. Like there's no if, ands or buts. Um, but I think that's, that's one side that I have yet to kind of help have open-mindedness, but Hopefully with all this stuff that's changing, I mean, now they're open to the vaccine. They weren't before. So I'm glad that's helped them out. And, you know, just little steps here and there that they're realizing to trust 
more of science, more of our society, more of our generation and how we're moving forward um, is, is insane. But, you know, to be out, to be, to be blind, it was a little tough seeing the, just the generation, just the differences um, in politics and try not to bring politics at home, but it was still bringing politics at home um, was a big mess during that 2020 time period. I'm kind of glad we're over with now, honestly. <laughs> Living at home, it's, it's tough when, you, when you've already lived on your own, huh? Yeah, I always say, like, every time I come home, I do feel like I regress in a sense. Like, I always mention, like, I like my space here. Like, people are asking, why are you at UF now, even during this pandemic? I'm like, even just this change of space is rewarding, and it makes me, it makes me feel fresh. Um, you know, my dad still tries to do my laundry when I go back home. I'm like, dude, I've been doing laundry for the past four years. I can do it. I can cook for myself. Like, I feel like I don't grow when I go back home. I just come back to that shell. Um, not as much as I did before. Now when I go back, I still try to keep my college identity present. But back then when I would go home visit, I would feel like I would have to like, not mask myself, but change the way I would think or like act or like talk about stuff or just even then just act around around the house. Like here, I can't really be lazy if not nothing gets done. But back home, it's like welcomed. And I'm like trying not to have that because then that makes me lazy for the rest of the week. And then I come back to UF and I kind of miss that laziness of having everything pampered to me in a sense. And I'm just like, okay, now I realize, okay, when I go back home, I bring no laundry. I do all my laundry here, stuff like that. So little things like that, that make me feel like I need to keep growing as an adult um, before, you know, time, time is over, I guess, before I keep going back home and just regressing, if that makes sense. So as far as growth goes, do you think your diet has changed at all when you yeah. eat? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I never did a, meal plan so that was one of the biggest things but what i clicked in that dorm i don't i didn't even know i would make some random quesadillas i would make up i would have some good food but definitely once i moved into an apartment you know my culinary side started to expand i started to get more um tools and you know cooking materials and stuff like that has made it accessible um and then you know moving out to my internships i would cook for work and stuff like that so i felt like more of a grown adult so i will say my culinary experience has changed and adapted and grown better and been it's it's I, I call myself a chef right now before i wouldn't even tell you i would call myself a chef but i would just be making up struggle meals but now i would make some nice stuff yeah do you think that you've expanded beyond the typical cuban diet of yes. meat at all yes <laughs> yes um i remember my dad all the time like if i didn't feel like cooking he was like just go to miapa i'm like no dude i can cook that at home i'm not gonna spend the money if i'm gonna go out it's gonna be for like sushi for like nice good pasta or like something like that so definitely expanded for my culinary um experiences and then just having even uh, roommates you know we would cook for each other we would cook together so we would make i learned how to make mashed potatoes here at uf like i feel like also my parents never were into the cooking realm back at home so it wasn't as helpful um but once i got here that i realized okay i have all these utensils how do i make a great dish come out um and i've come a long way i make, I make a lot of different stuff now um, one of my favorites, the, the type of pasta that I make, but it's like still Cuban where I use the seasoning that you make the, your chicken with as part of the pasta sauce and it makes it taste really good. Yeah, it's a little tricks here and there. Obviously, TikTok has also helped me. I make some really good quesadillas because of TikTok, um, but I've definitely expanded and just now I know how to read a recipe before freshman year. I would not know what a fourth uh, an ounce or like quarter a teaspoon would be. Um, and obviously I would have to do a little cart to go into the, the dorm kitchen. Now here I have everything accessible. So I think I'm ready for the real world and the culinary actions from that. What about vegetables? You eat vegetables now? I, yes. I'm going to be honest. I, I don't think I ate a vegetable until I got to college. I didn't either. So I think that's something my sister has changed where she's implementing a lot of more vegetables into their diet. I used to be pretty overweight during my middle school elementary ages so once I got into high school that I got more into like weightlifting I started putting more into like vegetables and stuff like that um now I make some mean fire salads if I must say and stuff like that so I have incorporated in more like now I eat spinach I've opened up my palate before you can even ask me if I eat sushi now I do now I've eaten like uh, lobster I've eaten like more stuff that I've you know again my open-mindedness has expanded to not just like education it's open-mindedness to like welcoming in friends, welcoming in new recipes, welcoming to try stuff. Um, so it's definitely been part of the college identity because I feel like if I were to stay back home eating the same thing, I would have been complacent for sure, for sure, for sure. So it looks like time is is starting to run out. So I'm going to wrap things up with just a few more questions. If okay, you yeah. 
Uh, this has been exciting. I'm honestly glad that we were, we were doing this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you've been great. Appreciate it, appreciate it. The first one, uh, it's, it's definitely backtracking a bit, but why is it that you decided to study engineering? And I know you switched degrees at one point. Yeah, uh, still within engineering. Within engineering, but okay, then just more generally then, why engineering? Um, I think I never thought about college until my junior year of high school that I'm like, okay, this is closer than it seems. People are doing like flyout programs, this, this, and that. Um, I really loved math and science. I was part of the AP Calc, A, B, and B, C in high school. So I was like, okay, something in this realm would be doable. Um, and then still in the back of my head, I had my dad telling me like, hey, look into medicine, like look into this. So when I got to UF, um, that I was like, okay, I wanna do engineering. I had no idea that there was more than one engineering major. I thought it was just engineering. And then I get to UF and they're like, okay, choose one of 12. And I'm like, okay, this is like legit, this is serious. Um, I think I chose biomedical engineering because I had this idea of like, I like the building aspect, but I like the medicine aspect and I wanna build prosthetics. So that's what I started doing my freshman year. Then I got into chemistry, I realized that was not my forte. Um, I did not have chemistry in high school. That was literally the year our professor went on leave. So I was not even taught basic high school chemistry. And then when I got to that class, I was like, okay, this is tougher than what it actually is. And then if I want to continue with this, I have to do orgo, all this stuff. I was like, okay, no, let me reevaluate what I'm engineering, like what the engineering I'm into and then switch to another one. So that's when I switched to mechanical and decided to just maybe minor in biomechanics. And then during this time, I started picking up internships with P&G, so Procter & Gamble. And I started realizing like, okay, maybe the manufacturing side of things, the product design is what I like. It doesn't have to be building prosthetics to help the, the world because that's what I always wanted to do. Some, you know, be, you know, the freshman year of like, I want to help the world and do this. Let me do prosthetics. I realized like even just creating this deodorant is going to help the world and somehow. So that's when I realized I wanted to work into like product design and stuff like that. And then I took the design class, realized it wasn't my forte again. I realized I could not sit there for so many long hours, you know, putting in that one little screw in the design and making sure that it's perfect. I was like, no, I think I've been always more of the managerial route. And then after that last internship that I saw like the process engineers and stuff like that, I was like, okay, let me switch into industrial and systems. And that's where I am now graduating with that degree. Um, and then moving into consulting where I realized even then you can be a process engineer for project planning and making sure that a project flows well from beginning to end. Um, and I realized also I built a little bit more liking into the coding as well as a major started implementing more coding languages and stuff like that. But if you asked me from the very beginning, I would have not told you engineering was for me because of like where I am now. I would have told you it was just because I simply like math and science. And then that was the career path everyone pretty much told me to go to and then just venture out. But I was very lost when I got to preview that I saw the packet of like 12 engineering degrees. I didn't know what to do at that point. Um, but I am glad of all the switch arounds that I've done and where I am today and just being, you know, realistic with myself of like, what is it that you actually want to do? So I do value the internships for helping me realize that along the way as well. So how, if at all, did the pursuit of money inform any of your decisions? Uh, pursuit of money was there. I just knew regardless of what I majored in at UF, if I graduated with a college degree, I wasn't going to make a higher substantial money than even just my parents. So um, I wouldn't say like money would have been my overall thought of to where I wanted to get to. If that was the case, I would have buckled up and done computer science because you know they're getting paid way more than any other engineer in the business right now. But I was realizing like, what is it that I wanna do? And if that's what I wanna do and it gets paid pretty well, then I'll, like, I'll take it obviously. Um, pay is a big factor, but not big enough that I'm like, you know, if I don't make 100K during my first year, I'm not gonna take it. Because for me, I lived with not enough, you know, enough to get us through and stuff like that, but I still feel like I was rich in a sense. You know, I still feel like with the middle-class money that we were earning and stuff like that, I still feel like I was not limited to a lot of stuff. You know, I still have my car, I still have this. Um, I'm also not a very big materialistic person. So I realize it's more about the experiences. So I think for me, what drew me more into engineering also was the international opportunities that you can have. And I was seeing that firsthand with P&G of how like some of them had to fly all the way to the Asia plant and work on that for a little bit, but also experience the world while, while they're at it. So that's one big component that drew me into engineering more than the money was that international aspect of like, you know, your project can be accessible here, but it can also be a project that you can do in, I don't know, the other side of the world. 
And just real quick, you said that you actually have a job um, yes. lined up. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Yeah, so um, just to backtrack it a little bit, I did. Um, so I did five years at UF. During those five years, I did and was humbly blessed when, you know, during my first year, some way, somehow a recruiter liked me enough to give me an internship offer with P&G. So I did two P&G offers in Cincinnati and then one in Boston. I pictured and thought that the Boston, you know, P&G Gillette location was going to be my ideal role and job. But on the side of all this P&G network, I was also networking for the consulting industry and just relatively new and, you know, uh, very a little bit more high in demand now. Um, I realized, like, you know, maybe this is a route that I wanted to take. So I did not accept my return offer for P&G and took the leap of faith and just decided to go with Accenture for that summer. Um, this was actually this past summer during COVID-19. So I worked from home, sadly, um, but still managed to make a great impact. So I was working with Accenture's development practices, and I was actually helping a university in Rwanda, Africa, kind of go through their mitigation plan of how they're going to open up their schools with all this COVID stuff. So it was kind of cool to like have me just through a laptop help a school in Rwanda, Africa since, you know, it's in Hialeah. Like, it's just crazy how, you know, if you pinpoint the map where I am in one little city in Florida, I was able to help them in Rwanda, Africa, mitigate and create a risk tool of like, you know, if you open up to this many students, if you open up to this, we can see the risk that it would take during COVID-19. And it was just the fact that it was so fresh during COVID-19. I felt like I was, you know, part of society and working forward to that. And so now I'll be going back. Uh, I got my return offer with them after my internship and I'll be joining them. Still don't know, and no details to come, hopefully vir probably virtual, but I will be joining them hopefully by August or September of this year. Um, I got the location offer for, California, but with all this being virtual, I might just start virtual and stay virtual. And so we start moving back into the office. Sounds like you're off to do some amazing things. I I'm just excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Just one more question for you. So if you had to summarize the college experience for you in just one word, what word would it be? Mm -hmm. I would say passion. Um, I think it's cliche and I think I say this every interview um, that they ask me about a word, but I think it's a tough one because it's, there's just so many words that can encompass everything, but the passion that it took for me to be a first generation, the passion that I took to realize like, you know, um, I am where I am today, the passion that it took to get through my engineering degree, the passion that it took for all the intentional involvements that I was doing. You know, at one point through my involvement past, I was realizing that I was just joining other orgs for their titles and their names and not even doing it for the passion and the real realization behind it. And I realized that once I got into Engineers Without Borders, I'm like, this is, this is my calling, this is my passion. So I think I realized at UF what my true passion is and like what I wanna to continue to do and I will take my UF identity as one of the strongest identities. Like I was talking with my friend the other day of like how college shaped the identity of who I am. Like it's part of my identity. Um, so I think the overall word would say passion um, just because it's made me realize the passion that I can endure to things. But I think I would have not realized that if I did not come to college or at least, you know, come to a out of, out of the city college and stuff like that and got the whole experience. So um, passion would be my word. Well, <clears throat> I think it fits. I think it suits you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I like that. I, I feel reassuring. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little new to this. So thanks for... No, you did good. No, I appreciate it. You kept the conversation. I can blab on for forever. So I appreciate the transcending questions. Well, you were a great interviewee. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording now. Perfect. Any, any last words you'd like to say? Um, no, I guess just for archive's sake, you know, if I see this in like 10, 15 years, um, never forget of like where, you know, where we've come from, especially us being first generation students and how we got there. And I'll also just always remember to kind of give back. Um, I think that's one of the most important things and that keeps you grounded um, and that keeps that passion flowing. You know, there's a reason that passion came from somewhere. So just remember where that came from. Goodbye, us. Goodbye. <laughs>